Hi, everyone, and welcome. Um, so excited that we have so many people joining, especially on a Friday, busy, busy Friday. Um, thanks for coming. My name is Kelly Williamson. I'm the community manager here at the SUNY CPD, located in Syracuse. If you didn't know, I've been saying this all week, but we have moved locations, but we're still in the same building. And Jamie was actually a participant in our first ever hybrid event. So if you're thinking about doing a hybrid event and you have questions or you're thinking about working with the CPD on something, um, we still have an office space, we still have meeting space, and we'd love to uh, just discuss with you what you're thinking as we attempt to pull ourselves out of this pandemic phase um, a little bit more, but we're still in it, so we understand. Um, so today's presentation is super relevant, especially given where we are, um, regarding presentation best practices and wowing your audience. And um, I'm super excited to hear Jamie Heron, our colleague at the CPD. Um, she is the SUNY Online Program Manager. I said I would do a bio for you, Jamie, but I'm actually lying about that. And I'd love for you to just tell um, um, our participants today a little bit about your background because I thought that might be better than a boring yeah. biography um, if you just want to okay. pop to the next slide though yeah. um, just a few housekeeping things obviously if you've been participating you've heard me say this a bunch um, but every year we try to have a professional development week free programming that you can easily access after as well to share with your colleagues and your campuses um, but we really try to touch on personal professional um, academic and you know technical um, you know, development as well as some leadership skills with this. So we sort of hit every side of the coin for a campus. So faculty and staff and everyone in between. Um, and obviously at the CPD, uh, we're your central resource for professional development training and support. So if you have other topics, um, especially for next year, I know that you know a lot of you were disappointed that we had to cancel Beth's presentation about operations um, in collaborative spaces. So I would love to do that again. But if you have other topics, please feel free to let me know at any time. Um, and uh, next slide. This is more like the Zoom part. Um, when we started doing these, less folks were using Zoom as a everyday activity. But now, uh, just as a reminder, you're all muted. So if you could put any uh, questions in the chat, that would be great. I'll be monitoring the chat for Jamie. And you know, if the question is really timely with what um, she's talking about, we can stop and, and, and cover it. But we'll probably might save some for the end. This is going to be interactive. Um, Jamie says she has some Mentimeter um, stuff. So if you want to open a browser and get everything set up for that, that'd be awesome. I think you I just have your phone, by the way. Oh, yeah, so... your phone too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know if the next slide is still just the same like Zoom stuff. Um, I think that's all I have. Uh, so I'll be putting my email. Yeah. So comments, welcome. I'll be putting my email as well as Jamie's emails in the chat. And um, you can follow up with us, especially about topics or anything you see here. Next week, you should get an email um, that talks about where to find the materials from this week, as well as the link to the YouTube and all the recordings. So um, with that, I'd like to introduce and thank again my colleague, Jamie Heron. Thanks, Kelly. This is great. Thanks for the opportunity to share. Uh, I know Kelly wanted me to share some of my bio. I am kind of a... a person of all trades. I, I started out as an online instructor. I moved over into instructional design at SUNY Broome Community College, and um, I'm still an instructor, but now I am the SUNY Online Program Director or Manager at uh, the SUNY Center for Professional Development. And it's kind of my pleasure, actually, as part of my job. I love my job, is coordinating uh, professional development opportunities, workshops, trainings, webinars, et cetera, for online practitioners, which covers anybody who does any kind of learning or content online. And uh, as a part of that, I have attended, as I'm sure many of you have, any number of conferences, some online, some face-to-face, -face, you know, in the olden days. And as a part of that, I've kind of really developed a sense of what I appreciate seeing in a, in a presentation and what I definitely could do without in a presentation. And I've watched my own presentation style evolve over the years, and I've developed my own kind of voice and, and strategy for developing these presentations. And I'm certainly not the you know end all be all expert, but I certainly do like to have a, a good time with my presentation. So I'm I'm happy to sit here and talk with you today and not talk at you, but just to share some of the things that I've learned and then maybe learn from you as well. So with that, 
I want to do the first thing that we should always do when we're doing a presentation is set expectations for our audience. And that uh, includes going over what we're going to cover. And first, we're going to talk about how to get started on a presentation. What are the steps to, to do that so that you're not backtracking and, and redoing work again, right? Uh, then we'll talk about maximizing text and not in terms of making your text really big, but how to get the most impact out of the text that you do include on your slides. We'll talk about some, some accessibility concerns and some uh, best practices for formatting, what is easily readable, what makes uh, the best kind of image, the best, best kind of font, et cetera, for formatting. And finally, we'll talk about some of the skills that are a part, it's actually more of an art when it comes to presenting. It's really being up on stage. It's about uh, engaging your audience, telling a story, et cetera. So that's what we're gonna get to today. As a part of this uh, presentation, and as something I like to include in the majority of my presentations is uh, including my audience in the presentation and partly because it keeps them engaged and partly because um, I like that that feedback, although Zoom makes it relatively easy to get feedback, but I've I've become uh, a big fan of Mentimeter. And so if you want to uh, participate, you can participate either with your computer or you can just pull up your phone and, and open up the camera and aim the camera at the QR code here. And then you can participate on your, your smartphone, which makes it a little easier to watch the computer and then uh, participate as you go. As we move forward, even though we're away from this particular slide, you will see that um, anytime there is a question that you can answer with Mentimeter, there will be the menti.com uh, website up there as, as well as the code that you need to join. All right, so I'm gonna just sit here for one moment. I see I'm getting a couple thumbs up in there. We can see them sliding up there with oh, 15. Excellent. I'll just give it one moment. I'm going to just keep pushing my thumbs up. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Is it just one person? No, it's not. All right. So as Kelly was kind of uh, thinking along the same lines as I was about getting some feedback from the audience about presentations. And first, I want to ask, you know, example, can you provide an example of what made a presentation less than stellar? It could have been a really good presentation, but this one thing stuck out or it could have been a horrible presentation overall, but, you know, go ahead and, and pop in some, a couple of words about what made that presentation less than stellar. I think that the read from slides is one that really, really is one of my major pet peeves. Um, oh, there we go. Lots, monotone, hard to hear, too wordy, wrong images. Slides that are too wordy. Death by PowerPoint. That was actually the name of my first uh, presentation was how to avoid death by PowerPoint, right? So what I'm getting from this is, uh, so you can, the Menti code is uh, at the top of the screen here, but I'll pop it in the chat. It's three, five, six, eight, five, nine, four, six. Of course, Amanda. So what I'm getting is people know what they don't like about presentations, right? They know what, what when they get in there and they're like, mm, this is going to cause me to get distracted by my phone, or this is not enough to keep me from being distracted by the thoughts going through my head, et cetera. It's not really enough to engage my attention or it's enough to be like, okay, if you've ever been at a conference and you actually get up and you leave because it's so bad, I've done that. Although I feel a little bit rude, I just wanna use my time more effectively. But it, it looks like quite a few of you are, are posting in here. That's great, boring, poor audio, tiny font. Too many filler words, right? Too many words, too many words. <laughs> yes, Sherry, I, there's a question in the chat. Is this a paid version of Mentimeter? Yes, I, I needed way more than the two questions. And I just, um, you know, pulled the trigger on that one. Got it. All right, so I'm going to move forward in my presentation here. And we're going to 
then asked the question, what makes a great PowerPoint, right? And my answer to this question is always, it depends on the context. We know that we have different, um, we have different audiences that we're gonna be presenting to. If I were going to be presenting this presentation to students, it would be an entirely different scenario. If I were presenting to faculty only, I would do it a certain way. If I was going to be presenting to administrators, I might change it. So it's really important for us to understand our audience, our time constraints, the, the availability of media, the availability of, of microphones, the availability of, of pretty much anything that surrounds the, the presentation that we're making. And so and understanding the context in which you'll be presenting, the audience to which you're presenting makes all the difference. And, and that's the only way you can answer this corrupt question, what makes a great PowerPoint? But I'm gonna ask you then, to give me an example of something that impressed you or caught your attention during a presentation. And while you're answering this, I'm gonna tell a story about one of the most impressive presentations I've ever seen. And not just because of me, but because of what happened to the audience. And I attend a number of conferences and this one in particular is a whole bunch of, of nerds like myself. And when we go to this conference, we sit at tables and all of us always have a computer open and you hear, clicking and typing on the keyboard. And this woman came from Penn State and she was doing a presentation and it was the strangest and most bizarre thing I've ever experienced at a conference. It was this slowly, you noticed everybody's heads shifting from their, their computer screens up to, to the front. And then slowly you heard the clicking dissipate and then almost virtually everyone had their their uh, laptops closed. That woman grabbed the attention of an audience that is very resistant to um, giving full attention and had it from the first moment to the very end. It was, it was very impressive. So uh, that was something, and it was, it was her uh, demeanor. It was, she was using something innovative at the time and it was really, she had an engaging presentation style. So let's see what people said here. Good visuals, enthusiasm, right? Uh, good use of humor, clear graphics, sleek design, pictures that represent the point instead of bullet points. Ooh, you guys are, I feel like you're making my presentation for me today. Interactivity, told a story, uh, the presenter's passionate, conversation is not one way, and a unique slide deck, a bit of theater responsive to the audience, right? Um, and the woman that did that presentation from Penn State, she had, yes, all of this, and it definitely made an impact. So thank you for sharing that. Let's talk about where we go when we get started. And one of the things that I always fall back on when I get started is what they used to teach us in fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, right? When we're writing, we're first learning how to write a paper, start with an outline. And I used to hate this practice when I was when I was younger, like just let me get to it. But now, after so many, it's been many years, right? Since I was in fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade. But um, I understand the purpose of that. It's to organize our thoughts. It's to make sure that we have the main points stated uh, in in writing, or at least in our our um, in our brains there and gives us our transition statements, it gives us our thesis statements, et cetera, so that we can then start a PowerPoint presentation or a Prezi presentation or a Mentimeter presentation with the order already set. We already know what our main points are and it really cuts down on the amount of time that we have to spend backtracking or correcting something that we, we did when before we had a clear picture of what was going on. And then I, then I focus on something, it's a psychological principle, and despite the fact that it is a formal principle, it's called chunking, and it's, it sounds less formal that way, but really what it is, is our working and short-term memories have only a limited capacity to hold information at any one time. And that magic number is seven, but really it's more like five for, for busy humans with a cognitive load, like, like all of us here as professionals. And so when we present too much information at once without a break or without context or without a story interspersed there, the audience, um, their brains are literally overloaded and they, they are no longer attending to or they're no longer remembering what we said at the beginning of the presentation. So keeping this chunking concept in mind will help you as you're working with 
working through creating your presentation. And which leads me to this slide where simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. If you have a super complex topic, you, you probably heard this when you were in grad school or in, in college, if you can't explain a complex topic in an elevator pitch, then you don't really understand that topic. And I think that it's helpful to remember as a presenter that I need to titrate down all this information that's in my head and just give the bare minimum so that gives someone enough of an idea to, to move forward. And so keeping things simple is really what's going to keep your presentations looking sharp engage, and keep them engaging. Right, uh, so Trang mentions here, my kid says you should be able to explain a complicated concept to a fifth grader. Absolutely, and if you can't, then you need to rethink how you are conveying that information, you, using too many terms, using too much of the, you know, the when we talk about the DLE implementation in the LMS, we have to remember that we need to say, this is a distance learning environment and a learning management system. It's making sure that your audience can understand what you're saying and stop using Using that kind of short, those shortcuts uh, that we use typically when we're, we're talking with someone who's like an absolute peer in that project. I like to follow two different presentation styles. And the first ones I'm going to talk about is the Guy Kawasaki rule. And what it essentially breaks down to is 10, 20, 30. And we see it as 10 slides for 20 minutes with a 30 point font. And so we say, if roughly for every for every minute we have or for every slide we have we need two minutes to present and so if you know that you're going to have sorry if you know that you're going to have a 60 minute presentation you know that you can have 30 slides and um so i do an extrapolation of that 10 20 30 because you know as an academic this is pre pretty much what we get we get an hour, or we get an hour 15 with our students, or we get an hour long webinar. So I divide that, I extrapolate that out to a 30, 60, 30. 30 slides, 60 minutes with a 30 point font. I don't change that font size, right? Even though I've extended the length of my presentation. You could do this for anything. If you had 90 minutes, 45 minutes, just divide those minutes in half. And that's at roughly how many slides you have, you'll have to have. That is unless you use this 2020 rule. And this is a different type of presentation style entirely. And this is brought into popularity by Steve Jobs. If you've ever seen any of his presentations online, you'll notice that he does this. He'll show this really dynamic image, uh, this really engaging, brilliantly edited image, whatever. And then he'll only say a couple things before he moves on to the next image. And that's the 2020, he's gonna have uh, 20 slides, he's going to spend 20 seconds on each. It's really short. You're going to move through and every time you get to a new image, there's not a lot of text on the screen. It's just an image that's going to uh, highlight what you're saying and make a really big impact. You can do uh, like an interleaving though of these two styles. And it's a really great way to have some content that's got some words and some text that's important for your students or your audience to see, but then also then weave in that 2020 style to kind of recapture the attention of your audience. So I wanna ask a question, how often have you used any of these presentation styles before? And you might not have known that there was an actual name for those presentation, presentation styles, but you were using them kind of intuitively. So it's kind of getting an, an idea of whether or not people have used that 10, 20, 30, which is you can use text, but you know you keep it large and you kind of minimize the number of slides. Or if you've used this 2020 style that uh, is, is more, um, it's really speech heavy, not a lot of slides. You just talk really fast and you move through your images quickly. So we can see here that we have uh, a larger handful of individuals who have never used the 10, 20, 30 with some using it fairly often. And then way more people have never done the 2020. 
that's a little bit more challenging, particularly if we're working with um, students, right? We're trying to convey that information. It's a little bit more challenging, but it is definitely an interesting way to recapture their attention. I typically do that in that lecture. And we'll talk about this a little bit later when it comes to grabbing their attention. Uh, as attention start to wane, shifting your presentation style for just even a minute is enough to uh, like shock their nervous system into uh, regaining their attention there. I love this, this image here of my, my little piggy bank and I, I'm a bit of a, a wordy person I, and my emails tend to be really long and I have to really focus my attention when I am doing my presentations in order to be a text miser. You saw in that earlier slide where I was asking people what were things that kind of were less than stellar in a presentation and it was the overly wordy paragraphs of text right and so as we're making these presentations it's important for us to consider like the the cognitive load we're going to put on people having tons of of text so it's important for us to be a text miser and what does that look like well we're gonna set some word limits. And first we're gonna do essentially what we have laid out in our outline. We have one main topic, we're gonna to put one main topic per slide. And then we're gonna really try to minimize the, the number of words. We want no more than six bullet points and we want no more than six words per bullet point. And I know it says 25 words per slide, but if you're gonna have six bullet points and six uh, words per uh, slide or per uh, bullet point, then you're gonna end up with 36 words, right? But really what you're gonna try to do is limit the number of phrases that you use for a bullet point and try to have just one to two words per bullet point. So um, we're really gonna try to condense that all down. And if you can't do that on a single slide, break that idea up into two separate slides so that again, you're conveying the same amount of information but in two different slides. So you're not overwhelming the audience member with a lot of text on that slide. So what kind of presentation author are you? Are you, and there's no judgment here, uh, we've, I've certainly overwhelmed people, people with the amount of text on my slides, so, so don't think that there's going to be any judgment. Are you a text miser with 25 words or less, a text minimalist with between 30 to 40, a text liberal with full sentences on your slides regularly, or a text glutton with full paragraphs, giant paragraphs of text on your, your slide? Which one? This is good to see. I'm seeing lots of people shooting for that max of 30 to 40. Um, it's, it's hard to be a text miser. It really takes a lot of editing. I, back when Twitter used to be just 120 characters, it was much harder to, to tweet. And uh, I like to think of it as an email subject line, like how can I catch their attention with the fewest words possible? Um, or like a, a headline in a newspaper, right? We try to monitor the use of our words uh, closely there. I sometimes get pushback when I talk about being a word miser, uh, about I have to share this information with my audience. It's really important that they get it and that they understand. And so it's, an, it's helpful for us to think outside that box. Well, how else can I share that information if it's not staring at them in the face with my presentation there. And you can consider any of these options. You can provide guided notes ahead of times, like, hey, here, here's a notes section. Go ahead and this is a preview of my presentation. Just fill in next to that slide uh, anything that you took from what I'm saying that, that is helpful, that adds to this information already provided. I typically do that for a technical training. It makes it really easy for them to follow along. They don't feel like they have to write everything down. And then if there was something that caught their attention or would be a shortcut for them, they can just add that there. You could use the note sections of a PowerPoint and then provide the PowerPoint to the audience so they can see the, the engaging slide live and then get all of the information that you're conveying verbally to them uh, in the notes section. You could provide a written summary at the end of your presentation. So if you don't want to provide those guided notes ahead of time, you could do that afterwards. You could provide a Google Doc link so that people can uh, access it long after your presentation or even uh, collaboratively take notes together in that Google link during your presentation. So there, there are lots of options that uh, 
can help you convey the information without overwhelming your audience with text on the screen. So have you ever used any of these methods that we were just talking about? Have you uh, used these tools so that you could minimize the, the text on your presentation slides? Or are there any other kind of strategies that you've used that you'd like to share? A note section. That's what I typically do for my students. A live demo, guided notes and notes section, yeah. Yeah, group note taking. Yeah, the Google link is really helpful, right? Uh, PDF after the fact, I think that's always helpful. I think the, the uh, paper afterwards can help clarify any misconceptions that uh, got developed during the presentation as well. Yep, follow-up documentation. So that's again, a way for us to um, be mindful of what the audience wants live and the information that they might need later. Yeah, handouts with step-by-step -step instructions, really important. So let's talk a little bit about formatting. Um, I see Joseph uh, posted that he gave out slides with the notes. Great. Let's talk about formatting. We all know when we've seen a good presentation that something, or even when we look at a uh, good web design or we look at a, you know, a, a product, like I always love it when Apple sends me their packaging, right? I buy something new. I just love the, the way they've designed it. So we all know what we like. We don't always know how to create that, right? I'm not necessarily creative. I'm crafty. I can copy somebody's stuff, but I have a harder time generating it on my own typically. And so you can use that when you're formatting for a presentation. Whatever you do for your formatting as you're going, it's really important that you're consistent throughout. If you're going to uh, be, if you're going to write full sentences, it's important that you a continue to write with full sentences throughout your presentation. It's important if you're going to use uh, punctuation at, at one point on an individual slide that you use punctuation throughout that slide. The more consistent you can be with with that type of formatting, the more professional and polished your presentation ends up looking. You can use uh, keywords and, and specific formatting to call attention to important things. Like if you're doing a presentation for students and you're presenting definitions, you know, underlining and putting a colon behind that lets your audience member know like, oh, that's formatted the same as that, the last one. I'm going to expect that that's a definition. And then that learning curve decreases throughout the rest of the presentation or the semester as you go. You can use color or you can use bold, or you can use maybe even a different font thrown in there every once in a while to draw important distinctions for a specific word or concept on your slide. It's really important, though, that when you're doing that, you keep um, accessibility in mind so that you're not necessarily using like red text against a green background because then the somebody who's colorblind might not be able to read that, et cetera. So when you're using the, the formatting, just pay attention to those accessibility issues. And then for hyperlinks, I know it's really tempting for us to put the full hyperlink so that someone in the audience could type it into their phone or into their computer. It's just, it's overwhelming sometimes those, those URLs, unless you have a tiny URL, right? You can provide the PowerPoint later, and then they can click on the hyperlink there. When you use color, we're gonna talk about this a lot with formatting. The use of color is key. It, it's, it grabs people's attention. It makes uh, um, important concepts appear more in, important, right? Um, but the, we need to make sure that there's a contrast between the background color and the text color. And that's what we mean by high contrast because if you have a low contrast, um, it makes it challenging for people to read that slide. Originally, when I put this image in here, it was the bright primary colors and the contrast between the words and the background was so slight that it was really hard to read. So I took the image out, I kind of shadowed it out a little bit. And as soon as I brought it back in, that the contrast between the back and the, the uh, foreground was much uh, easier. When you're using color, you want to uh, choose a color that's going to minimize eye strain. And I, 
if you'll recall the slide that says simplicity is the um, ultimate sophistication, that bright yellow, that is a slide that that color is going to cause eye strain if you use a lot of that and for an extended period of time. So if you're going to use a bright color like that, make sure it's really limited and that you move off that slide really quickly. It can't underestimate uh, how much strain that actually puts on a, a reader's eyes and then they get more fit fatigued much more easy, much more easily. There we go. Uh, you'll notice that my theme for this particular presentation is kind of grays with white or black text. And um, I'm using color just to highlight a couple things. And if you're going to do that, that's great. Just make sure you're minimizing how many colors. You don't want a rainbow of fruit flavors on every single slide. It's going to be overwhelming. And stick to a scheme. I, I, my themes are typically a white, gray, or black, or dark blue background with like the opposite color. So if, if it's a white background, it's usually a, a dark black text or a dark blue text. It just depends on if I'm doing a SUNY presentation or a CPD presentation or one for myself. Font, and this is one of the major accessibility issues we should all consider when we're doing a presentation. We wanna maintain that 30 point font minimum and that's to assist people in the way back to be able to read your presentation. But even more important than the font size is the font type that you're gonna select. And typically anything that is called sans serif is good. And what, what a serif is, is hang on just a second, I'm gonna turn on my spotlight. You can see here at the bottom of the M, the top of the M, the bottom of the N here, there is a little uh, elaboration. There's an like a, extension of the ending of that line, and that's called a serif. And for individuals who have certain reading disorders, um, that makes it really difficult for them to determine what that letter is. So we recommend you use a sans serif, which means without that elaboration. And some examples of good font choices are Arial, Calibri, or Tahoma. There are any number of additional sans serif fonts, you can certainly choose what those are. These are just my favorites. My go-to is Calibri. Um, some people hate it. I love it. It's, sometimes you'll find that people are really passionate about their font choices. If you've ever seen the, uh, the SNL skit with uh, Papyrus, it's kind of funny. People really do have a, a firm preference for, for fonts. So I'm, I've mentioned accessibility <laughs> a couple of times. I see Miriam's is indicated very passionate. For you to rank your level of awareness of accessibility and then rank your efforts to ensure accessibility in all of your presentations. And you'll notice that we have low to high. So it looks like this is great because I would say four or five years ago, we would have had numbers way down here, but I'm seeing this number shift much further to the right. Comic Sans fans, where are you? Yeah, that's from the early aughts there, Kelly. Sorry, <laughs> that time has passed. Listen, some of them are still out there. <laughs> I know. If you're one of I them, know. I'm sorry. I'm not, not. you. Not you. <laughs> I am <laughs> not. <laughs> I'm definitely not. All right, great. That's That brings me a lot of, of happiness to, to see that accessibility issues and the efforts are, are very high. So I hope we keep those up. So let's talk about animations, right? When PowerPoint first started, it was this new thing and you could use these animations to make your, your presentations much better than the overheads with the, <laughs> the remember that pen that you had to use? It was like a, an oil or I don't even remember the kind of pencil it was, but it was very specific to use on those, those overhead sheets. And uh, the, the invention of PowerPoint changed the game entirely. Then they invented the animations to come with it and then people went crazy. So it, animations do serve a purpose, but we wanna make sure that if we're gonna use animations in any PowerPoint or presentation that they're limited in use and that they serve a, a distinct purpose. Like if you're going to ask your presenter or your class, whatever, a question, you might put that up in the title of your uh, PowerPoint and then do an animation to provide the answer after you've had the opportunity to talk with your class, give them the opportunity to respond with answers, and then you put the correct answer on. That's an absolutely excellent um, way to use animations within PowerPoint. 
but you want to make sure that they're subtle. Uh, you don't want to have tons of words flying into your presentation, making people dizzy or nauseated or, or distracting them from the message, right? And if you, if you can at all, avoid sound effects, because what happens with sound effects is if you're in a large room and you're using sound effects, you don't know what the sound system is going to be like that. And it could either be like really loud. I was actually in a presentation where they had like um, it, a crash sound when something came in and it scared the audience. It was, it was beyond startled. It was scaring to them because it was really, really intensely loud. So you might wanna uh, use sound effects very, very judiciously. When it comes to graphics, uh, it's, it's important to use graphics that are inclusive and um, intentional. Graphics that are going to serve the purpose to either add humor or they're going to uh, bring your personality into the presentation or they're there to um, kind of supplement, uh, reinforce what it is that you're saying. And in doing so, you wanna make sure that those graphics are professional looking. Uh, Microsoft products have actually improved their clip art from the time that I used this presentation first way, way back. Uh, but what you will find sometimes if you're using the really kind of basic clip art in your presentation, it kind of undermines the uh, professionalism associated with your presentation. When we're talking about inclusive presentations, you might want to make sure, or you should make sure actually, not might, that your images are reflective of your audience and not just of what you might be most comfortable or you might have these, the most photos in your, your phone of. Although if I were to use uh, photos from my phone, it would just be all my cats. But um, anyway, we wanna make sure that we're including pictures of uh, people of color, uh, that you're using pictures of individuals with disabilities, et cetera, just to make sure that your images in your uh, presentations are as inclusive as possible. So I see uh, we're going to get to what's happening in the chat here, but I want to make sure that we're also limiting the use of GIFs or GIFs, if you say it wrong. <laughs> I'm just kidding. People feel very passionate about that particular thing too, GIF versus GIF. But uh, it's, it's okay to use a GIF now and then, but just make sure that you're going to move off that slide relatively quickly. So um, GIF out of here, right? So where do you get your uh, presentation images from? And if you want to pop that in there, I know a couple of you have been putting it in the chat, but I wanted to use this interactive um, tool to get people to put those in. I, in particular, use Canva. I love Canva. It is my favorite thing. Creative Commons, Google, the Google, right? Canva, yay. Uh, Pexels. TechSmith assets. Nice. Lots of people are using Pexels. Pixabay. The thing we have to be careful about with just using Google is sometimes you run into copyright issues or um, you know permissions issues. So using these Creative Commons or uh, Pexels or or Canva, you're using things that are are shareable, right? They they don't actually belong to somebody else. These are some great ones. I appreciate the people who are doing Canva there. I might have to check out Pexels though, and Pixabay. Great, thanks for that. When we talk about themes, we talk about, you can typically think of the, uh, when you're opening up PowerPoint, you see that theme bar across the top. I tend to have people avoid using those and that's in part because sometimes they add in extra elements that are inaccessible. And then if you do an accessibility check, you'll see that the reading order is off or that an image isn't, um, uh, accessible or there's no alt text that that's decreasing in like in in likelihood with uh, PowerPoint they're making much more of their their tool fully accessible um, I see Richard posted yes absolutely I'll make these available I'm happy to share um, so if you're going to avoid using those PowerPoint templates how do you get started 
And for me, what I typically do is I'm like, well, which, which audience is this for? Is this for a Sunni audience? And I typically go for a dark blue background with white lettering, or I do a white background with dark blue lettering, right? That fits with the Sunni theme. Or I, for anything science-based, I typically do a black background with white text. It just depends on what my audience is. And once I consider that theme, then I go from there. And once I've selected that course theme, I slip into the best invention ever as far as um, uh, presentations are concerned, and that's PowerPoint Designer. So if you have ever used it, you'll, you'll understand why it really changes your presentation from that standard title, text on the left, picture on the right kind of format. You can do that and then Designer uh, puts it into something like this, which looks so much better, so much more professional. And you don't have to worry about being able to format that yourself. And it tends to, as long as your, uh, what you did in the beginning was accessible, this slide ends up being accessible as well. I think that uh, it changes up the pace a little bit uh, from students going from one class to another or people going from one presentation to the other. They look a little bit different. If, as long, if your presentation looks different from someone else's, they're more likely to remember it etc. So I, I definitely appreciate the use of that. Now, we've talked about formatting, we've talked about how to get um, uh, your presentation started. But now that you've done all this hard work, right, we know that that hard work deserves a really good presentation to go along with it. So here are some things that we can do to give a good presentation. First, spell check, right? Uh, spell check, of course. Uh, presentation, um, uh, uh, sorry, PowerPoint does a little red lines under words that are misspelled, but it's not going to do a red line under the word for if you mean F O R or there, 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 right? It's not going to underline it if you've done it wrong. And that's where it's really important for us to do spell check. Then once you've done spell check, Put your slides into the slide sorter so that you can uh, take a uh, like a step back at your presentation and just see does this look does this look right does does it follow a cohesive order is the format consistent do I have all of a sudden all of my images are on the right throughout all of my presentations and then there's one with it on the left did I do that intentionally or was that a mistake and I need to shift that? So using that slide sorter is going to uh, allow you to figure that out. And then this is not an error. I really do encourage you to spell check twice. And what I do is actually go back through my slides in reverse order so that I remove the, the kind of, I would talk in this way. And so I'm going to read this way and my brain fills in the errors that might or might not be there. So if I take that context away, I'm really focused on the words that are being, uh, that are typed there. It does help with your spell check there. And then next, practice. Last night I sat down and I practiced to make sure that I had enough time to do this. I used PowerPoint coach. I have a tendency to use certain words too much, like so and right. And so PowerPoint coach will identify the use of repetitive terms and call that to your attention. It also uh, helps you with your timing, et cetera. So how do you practice for your presentations? What do you do to make sure that you're ready? Or do you wing it? Are you one of those people that can just wing it? I can for some things, but I don't tend to like it when I'm doing a presentation on presentations. There you go, wing it. Very good. Practice, practice, practice. Read aloud once, good. Rehearse without notes, recorded and watch. Present in front of family, great. Go through it just once. Yeah, right? Hashtag goals. Oh, so over-practicing makes you more nervous. So I wing it mostly. That's the way my husband does it. I cannot. Present to my cat. Yes. I can't tell you how many presentations my cat has heard. I have a script in webinars. Yes. Practice. Know your key points. Great. I have uh, quite a few people who it looks like we've got some on the wing it side and some on the practice side. And I think that's all right. So... <laughs> 
when we did the, see the word. So I, every time I say it, I hear it. <laughs> thanks. Thanks. PowerPoint coach. But when we're talking about the presentations, what we can do to make them really engaging, it's, it's engaging in the storytelling and not just reading off what's on your slide, but really saying like, I'm going to make this information relevant and I'm going to help you tie it to maybe one of your experiences by tying it to one of my experiences. Like I did about the woman from Penn state presenting um, that a, it brings, it provides that context. It allows people to say, oh, this isn't just blank, the, a bunch of information. This is something that's important. This is relevant, et cetera. So in, engaging in storytelling is, is uh, a key part of a good presentation. You're up on stage. They came to hear you, right? They came to hear what this topic means to you and, and how you work with the information within this topic. And so it's an, it's an integral part of presentations to actually engage in storytelling. And we can use our PowerPoint slides as this, this guide for us, like not to read here, like I would if I were a newscaster reading a teleprompter in front of, front of me, but more of like, oh, this slide, this slide is really about me telling people to use this as a reference and then talk to the audience about what this, this slide is supposed to mean, right? And you don't want to be the worst thing you want to get up in front of the room and do is just read. It's like, I have a quote here and I'm going to read this quote to you, even though your audience can read the quote themselves. Problem with that is that people read at a faster rate than someone can orate. And so you get this desynchrony between what the presenter is saying and what the audience is actually reading. And the audience isn't paying attention to the person doing the speaking anymore. So it's important to, to not use it as a teleprompter and to use it just as a prompt to get you to convey the information so that we're like, oh, this is an important point and now I'm gonna talk to you about it kind of thing. We should all focus on building in pauses and you'll notice that throughout the presentation, I have added um, these, these little opportunities for interaction. And the reason for building in pauses is it goes back to that uh, working memory uh, little nugget of information I provided you before. And what we see is that the attention span of a human adult used to be about 15 minutes, but now we're seeing that the attention spans are really more six to 10 minutes max. And so if you can bring in a pause to tell a story, to do something interactive, et cetera, or to even shift up that 10, 20, 30 with a 2020 uh, presentation style, you're gonna jog the individual's brain into paying attention again. And it's not a function of someone's inability to pay attention. It really is th the way our human brains work. And so if you can work with uh, the limitations that our central nervous system has by building in these pauses every six minutes or so, you're gonna find um, a huge advantage in your presentation, whether or not you're teaching somebody or you're, you know, you're doing something a little bit more interactive here. So how do you build pauses into your presentations? For me, I, I do a combo, right? I depends on how much information I have to throw at people. If I have to throw a lot of information at people without having to, um, without the opportunity to stop and get feedback, that's when I do the 10, 20, 30 with a 20, 20 interaction. I just try to like bang them over the head with uh, their attention span with something a little bit different and shift forward like that. Uh, taking uh, questions, right? Telling stories. Yes, that shutting up after a, a question is important, right? Adding that little kind of uncomfortable pause that might seem really long actually encourages your audience to participate because they're like, oh, well, they're not gonna fill that pause, so I had better. Switch speakers back and forth, nice. Pause for Q&A, give examples with the story. Uh, silences scare me too, but you have to get comfortable with that uncomfortable and that actually forces your audience to participate back. Great. I, I see a lot of people asking questions. That's, that's, I think the key way. And I think uh, audience members appreciate that rather than being talked at, they, they get brought into it. Oh, physical space too. Eileen, I'd love to 
uh, follow up with that when I'm done, if you if we could. So I encourage people to said so again. Uh, invite your audience, uh, and you can do that by creating this um, inviting, immersive experience for your audience, um, like using Mentimeter or using polling within Zoom or using something on everybody's phone, et cetera. Or if you're in uh, an audience, you can hand out cards and have them raise cards depending on which answer they're going to give. You know, lots of different ways for people to participate to, uh, to get them engaged. Um, and if it's an appropriate group, you could have them break out into uh, breakout groups or small groups to chat, et cetera. But making that experience more immersive uh, ultimately lends to more information being kind of uh, stored away in their long-term memory. <coughs> so what interactive or engagement tools do you use during your presentations? I obviously use Menti. Anybody else use something different? Uh, and it doesn't have to be a technology, right? We can use like Eileen uh, uses physical space, a new topic equals a new location on the stage. Really interesting, Slido, Kahoot. Yes, I've used Kahoot too. I think that, think pair share, nice. Making a joke, breakout rooms, stories, examples, Nearpod, Top Hat. Great. Padlet. An oldie, but very goodie. Breakout rooms, right? You could also use your slides as prompts. Like sometimes I'm presenting a topic that can be a little bit challenging. So you can, you can draw something, right? I was drawing uh, a quadrant the other day, trying to help people understand the difference between positive and negative reinforcement and positive and negative punishment. And so it's easier if I draw something and they can see that which quadrant a, a behavior modification falls under, which quadrant it's gonna fall under. So I will put a blank space onto one of my, my presentation slides and then I can draw on it. So prompts like that are very helpful as you're moving through your presentation. So now I have to go back to mouse. Speaking of that, do you need a time prompt? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, and then you know, find your voice. You're going to want to make sure that you're not reading your slides and you're not talking in this monotone voice that is going to put people to sleep or turn them off. You want to be engaging. You want to change uh, when you're talking about something super exciting. You you want that excitement to come through in your voice. Most of us got into the work that we did because we're passionate about it. And we can use the inflection in our voices to carry that message across and express your personality. Like I'm a dork that comes across in almost all of my presentations and that authenticity comes across to your audience really well. So, you know, feel free. Yes, uh, this is from a concert. I actually was at the venue and we got front row seats while we were at the ven venue. We were up in the nosebleeds and we were being such dorks and so excited about it that the, the crew came up and gave us front row seats. We're so excited. So express your personality, get that across your audience, that authenticity, that authenticity kind of increases the buy-in, increases the engagement, et cetera. So uh, I know we're close to the end of time, but what other questions do you have for me? Or is there anything that you wanna share? Or is there something that uh, you think that maybe you use in your presentation prep or delivery that it would be helpful to others? So feel free to type something in and we can see it here otherwise. That was, I, I practiced and I got it within the time frame and I'm still there. So um, let yeah, me know good. if you have any questions. Awesome, yeah. I don't think we missed anything in the chat. There was a question about the PowerPoint um, designer, but I think that was answered in the chat. Okay. I wasn't sure if that was an add on, but it should be with all the 365s, right? It like is. Your licenses from your campus. It is. Um, I had to put a note in there about investing in yourself. So like you like Mentimeter, right? So you're, you know, you're like, hey, I'm going to get this, you know, or make your campus or your department pay for it if they will. Um, but I think that's key too. You're, you're a presenter, like your brand. Right. You know, so and 
Yeah. And it's helpful. Like when I was doing the Otter Institute this summer, there was so much information I really did want to collect from the audience. And this makes it easier for me to then go back and look at those tools or the the things that people said, it was really helpful for me for that matter too. So it was a professional advantage too. Uh, Joseph says, I insert summary slides and review a few keywords. I think that's really important too, that providing the, the summary makes them kind of review the information that you've already presented. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh, definitely. All right, everybody. This was really great, Jamie. Really? Oh, there you go. Thanks. Was this from Cold Plan? I'm just kidding. Was this no, from this is, this is from Canva. <laughs> I know, I know, but um, practice topic. Oh, rehearse with coach feature. Have you used that? Yeah, PowerPoint? I use that too. It's great. I would say like, I don't think necessarily that you saying so is such a big deal. I know you're conscious of it, I but am. sometimes I look at using those sort of um, like transitional, like, I don't know, like slang as a way to be relatable to the audience too. But I, you know, you have to be conscious of it too. Like if you're saying it every other word, that's a problem. <laughs> But I like to build them in, you know, to buy myself some time. Right. But yep, Kahoot is free. Yep, that's from you. Great. I think I think Padlet is free. A lot of the tools that people were putting forward is they're free. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So thanks for having me, Kelly. Oh, okay. well, thank you. It's a busy week, um, busy, busy year coming up for Jamie. Yes. Um, 2022. I'm sure you all be talking with her more. Um, <laughs> but we will be sending this out. Um, it will be posted on the site as well, but we'll also have the the recording in our YouTube um channel all next week. I might pull out the transcript for this as well, um, for the chat, even though we have the Mentimeter record in the recording. Um, so look for that and feel free to reach out to us at any time. Thank you for participating and have a great new year. I could I say that anything. it's almost the end of the month already <laughs> in the way I think. <laughs> um, great. All right. I'm going to stop the recording.